Hello, everyone, and welcome to Faux Real, a podcast that is the equivalent of peering into a spatial rift and having your mind blown into a thread of alternate reality where milkshakes drink you and drones were overhead dropping presents like your buddy in Pokemon Go. Hey, speaking of Pokemon Go, do you play? If so, you should add me as your buddy so we can raid together, battle in Battle League Season 6, and help each other get to level 50 before anyone else. Just send me an invite at 1935-1112-5094. My handle is CuddleDude, so you won't miss me. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I have an excellent guest today. In fact, this may be the best episode I've ever done. Have I ever said that before? Probably. Is it more true this time than it's ever been before? Of course! Because on today's episode, I welcome world-renowned drummer John Bermuda Schwartz, who has been Weird Al's drummer since 1980 and is the official archivist for All Things Al. He has also added author to his incredible resume as he has a new book called Black and White and Weird All Over, The Lost Photographs of Weird Al Yankovic, 83 to 86 which is a beautiful book of all black and white photos from Al's early career, spanning video shoots, recording sessions, and other special moments. I am extraordinarily happy to have a special edition signed copy number 86 of 250, and even more extraordinarily excited that I got to speak with John himself all about what went into putting the book together, what it's been like touring with Al all these years, and enjoy all the great stories John has to share about his journey of photography, instrumentation, and that time that he, Al, and the band were attacked by mayflies for an entire set. You can pick up your copy of Black and White and Weird All Over on blackandwhiteandweirdallover.com at your local bookseller and all the usual online retailers. The book itself has ampersands in the title while the site has actual ands, the word and, in the title as well, where you will find the book online. So, you know, just so you know. For more excellent Weird Al reading, check out Weird Al the Book by Nathan Rabin, The Weird Accordion to Al, also by Nathan Rabin, Weird Al Seriously by Lily E. Hirsch, The Weird Al Yankovic Relaxation Coloring Book by Rose Bradshaw, and the children's book, My Teacher and Me, by Al Yankovic himself. And for more superb Weird Al audio content, check out Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, where Dave Rossi and Ethan Ullman bring in all sorts of guests from throughout uh, Weird Al's career. It's really impressive what they pull off. They've pulled in some guests that are just unbelievable, including uh, also having... A few conversations with John Bermuda Schwartz where uh, and in the most recent episode in fact he shares a bunch of very exclusive clips uh, some of which I've never heard which is saying a lot because uh, you know I've been I've been at this a long time Dave you actually might know as the guy who spearheaded the campaign to finally get Weird Al his much deserved star on the Walk of Fame and uh, They are just uh, very entertaining guys, very cool guys, so definitely check out their show. If you love this show, this episode, or just love helping others in their creative endeavors, like me, check out Faux Real on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will unlock awesome exclusives, get to hear episodes before anyone else, have the opportunity to suggest future guests, and be the first to have access to some very cool and unique clips that no one has ever heard. Just go to patreon.com forward slash faux real, that's F-A-U-X-R-E-A-L, and throw in a few bucks to get started. And make sure to share it with your friends and fellow listeners. There's nothing like getting faux real exclusives in your stocking, and Patreon will be your Rudolph to get you there. And now, without any further ado, Let's get to my conversation with the phenomenal John Bermuda Schwartz. (laughs) 
With a stellar career spanning more than 30 years, performing alongside Weird Al Yankovic and his fellow bandmates, Jim West, Steve Jay, Ruben Baltiera, having played to many thousands of fans across stadiums and events around the globe, appearing on numerous late night talk shows and radio shows, including the Dr. Demento radio show in 1980, where he was asked to bang on Al's accordion for percussion as well as amassing an unbelievable treasure trove of photographs from those experiences, which he has assembled into a beautiful new book called Black and White and Weird All Over. I now welcome one of, if not, I will say it, the greatest drummer on the planet, John Bermuda Schwartz. Welcome oh. to Faux Real. Thank you so much. I didn't know you were talking about me. That sounded pretty good. <laughs> wow. No, I was actually talking about Animal from, uh, um, uh, the electric mayhem, but uh, oh well, well he deserves it. <laughs> also, oh, uh, underrated, uh, John. It's it's so wonderful to uh, to have you on this program. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, to be honest, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it, it casts quite a shadow to be in the presence of such greatness, and I am. Uh, it's just, I'm, I'm really overjoyed. So thank you for taking- Go on, go on you. <laughs> no, go on, go on, go on. The book is absolutely beautiful. I admittedly have interrupted, ah, and there it is. Thank you, I there have, it is. I have it behind me. Um, I, I actually interrupted my own research for this interview a number of times, leafing through the book again and again, because it's just, it's so glorious and uh, you know, there are so many amazing photos and great stories and little snippets and behind the scenes of everything that was going on through, uh, through all of those shoots and performances. And it's, and it's just really incredible. Um, oh, so, thank, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to have pulled one of the very few copies. Of course, they were um, released in a limited batch of 250 and uh, really cool to have your, your signature. Um, I honestly, you know, I've um, as much of a collector and archivist as I am of, uh, of all of Al's and, and your work, um, I have fallen way behind. So I found out about the book late and I was really excited to be able to grab a copy because I've missed out on so many things like I missed out on the uh, um, uh, you know the squeeze box collection never got one of those I'm still trying to uh, obtain the other books um, someday I will have uh, my own copy of the authorized Al but I'm still working on it so there's uh, there's a lot to be found for sure um, I want to just dip into some of the um, some of the the little blurbs that you talk about in the book. Uh, you mentioned in the book that you uh, you started out with a Minolta 35 millimeter, um, taking your first from uh, from a guy that was in your very first band. Um, want to talk yeah. a little bit about like. Uh, how is it using that camera? Like, how has the, the transition come? Like, what are you using now? Well, in, in, in those days, and this was probably 1974 sure. that I got the camera from this guy. And uh, um, just a, a real quick aside, uh, I ran into him at the NAMM show, uh, which is a, a music manufacturer's convention. Right. I'm and I, I, I'm somewhat in touch with him. His name is Jeff Rona. Uh, no, no relation to the pandemic. <laughs> anyway, he... Uh, uh, and it hadn't, I hadn't thought about that camera at all. I just, I hadn't made a mention of it at all. I just said initially when I wrote the, uh, that intro, you know, I got my first sort of nice camera and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And while I was talking to him, just, it clicked. I said, did you sold me your old Minolta camera? Didn't you? He says, yeah. And so I was, I, then I told him about the book. I said, there, I'm doing the whole book and I mentioned the camera and now I'm going to mention you. And, you know, he says, well, make sure you spell my name, right? So <laughs> As opposed to G E O F F, it's J E F F. So got it. But I, uh, you know, I honestly I don't remember what I was using before that. I don't think I had thirty five millimeter before that. I mean, I, I might have. I literally probably had a brownie camera. I probably had Polaroid cameras. Uh, I didn't really have like a nice camera. So that was my first one. Um, you know, I, I found that it was very inexpensive to uh, roll my own rolls of film. 
uh, you know, you could buy film uh, in, in like a hundred foot roll. And uh, there was a loader. You put the film in this thing and you put the snapped a, like a rechargeable cartridge, reloadable cartridge on the front of it and rolled it in like so many turns would give you like 36 frames. And uh, so I loaded my own film. I, uh, uh, cause I didn't have a lot of money, you know, so I didn't want to buy separate rolls if I couldn't avoid it. Uh, I found that it was cost effective to uh, develop and print at home. So I had a dark room at home uh, at my parents' house back in the day. We had a, a five bathroom home at a nice, wow. a nice big house for what was basically the three of us living there. So I took over one of the bathrooms and uh, I, I'd stay in there late at night with all the chemicals going into my system and all. I'm, I'm sure that didn't have much of an effect. Helps you to play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so I just, I, I would, I would shoot a lot of stuff. I actually took like a legitimate photo class in college, although I did that more to use their uh, facilities than to actually learn how to take pictures. But I learned a couple of neat tricks. And, uh, and I also shot color, but of course I couldn't develop color at home. But I knew that if I took pictures of friends and things like that, you know, that they should be color. And if I went on a vacation, it would be color. Uh, so by the time I met Al, um, I was still using that camera and I was, you know, mostly shooting color. I wasn't living at home anymore, so I really couldn't do black and white. Uh, so the, the photos, a three year span of these black and white photos, I got back into black and white just for him. And I had them developed at a lab and uh, we just had contact sheets printed, you know, just a sheet with literally all the negative strips on it so I could see what they were. And a couple of them from the first two videos were made into eight by tens. But beyond that, um, they, they weren't seen. They were just in an envelope and just put away and that was it. So I hadn't really, you know, it was, it was a long time before they sort of got examined again. And I realized, you know, some of these would be pretty cool to, to put out there. Camera wise, I went through a whole series of, of cameras, uh, uh, some 35 millimeter. I, uh, I think the last 35 millimeter camera I got was a little like a sure shot called made by contacts. It's a contacts T2. It's a very nice man, uh, automatic camera, but it has manual features as well. That's, that's like, you know, if you had like a Canon sure shot camera, like a little point and shoot camera, they mm -hmm. call them, uh, this was the point and shoot camera that like pro photographers like Annie Leibovitz and those, that was their point and shoot camera was okay. this contacts. So I really, I really wanted one. Well, by the time I got it, I was already starting to use digital and that didn't get a whole lot of use. And, and uh, I mean, I literally shot my last photos in 2006 with that. And that's the last time I shot film at all. And I went through a whole series of digital cameras as they became, uh, you know, more capable and, and, uh, you know, a larger resolution so you could do more with them, you know, I would buy a new camera, you know, and some of these cameras were really small resolution, like a 640 by 480, which was the size of a computer screen in 2000, pretty much. Right. Uh, that was like a $600 camera. And, and to look at it now, it's like, they're terrible. You know, there was a horrible little camera, but at the time that was the state of the art, really. Use what you and, have. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I went through a whole bunch of cameras and eventually phones got really good and really and they're always with you uh i've got a set of really nice lenses really proper you know glass lenses that screw in to a special case on my phones and and i can take i can do whatever these little point and shoot digital cameras can do you know with with a kit phone that's always on you know in my pocket right so that's become on the last tour i used to take a couple of cameras out on each tour Last tour, I don't think I took a camera out at all. I just I used, used my phone with these lenses and got all the stuff I needed. And, uh, you know, that, that was fine. So honestly, and I'm not saying the quality is amazing. I'm saying for everything I do, and if you want to make a 16 by 20 print, that's pretty easy to do with something from a phone. If you start out with a good, you know, full frame uh, image on the phone, you can make a, a very reasonable picture. I mean, I wouldn't make a billboard on the street with it, but... Uh, you know, I, I haven't had a need to go out and get one of these really, really nice Canon or Nikon, you know, type cameras, you know, with, with uh, the special lenses and, and, you know, that do all these tricks and take movies and things like that. I mean, that's not really what I use a camera for, mm -hmm. but I've been doing that with my phone and that's, you know, uh, so I, I've gone up and down and back and forth a little bit and, and I've kind of settled on my phone as a camera. If I was going to get into some serious work, I would go out and get a proper, you know, a Nikon or, or a, a Canon. I guess, and, you know, and with, with lenses, interchangeable lenses, you know, and, and uh, you know, then that would be another level, of course, and that would be a much nicer book, I assume. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty incredible just the way it is. And I, I love it so much. Um, it's definitely the pinnacle of, of my collection, which is intense, I will tell you. 
Um, well, thank you. It's uh, I, I love getting all the way into the, the deepest of, of the nerdy subjects. I would love to know like what kind of, you said you have the attachments, what kind of lenses do you use with your phone? Well, let's have a look. They're in there. Great. You've got a special a box. It's a company called Moment uh, that makes these and uh, literally, uh, well, there's a phone right here and it has a little bayonet mount over the lens mm -hmm. and uh Just so it's a around. little it's a little uh <laughs> yeah. front heavy this is uh this is the uh wide angle as opposed to a fisheye you know what i'll just i'll show you exactly what it is um oh cool nice is, is it even uh, oh you know what it's not i'm sorry that's that's a picture of you <laughs> there great so yeah talk about meta it's, it's very that's kind of trippy <laughs> and and there's uh there's a fish eye which is a little more extreme than that there's a, a two times telephoto which is great because you don't have to waste pixels to zoom in so it gives you twice the, the depth and then there's a macro lens which will literally take pictures of your pores Wow. On your skin, and not much else. I mean, I it it has one that. it has one depth of field. I mean, it has one focal length, and it's got a little guide on it that key, that that you put the camera on whatever it is, and it puts you at exactly the right length, and that's all you can do with it. But you can take pictures of the fibers in dollar bills or a piece of paper, the pores in your skin. I kid you not, it's scary at full, you know, at, a, at you know three thousand by you know twenty six hundred pixels right. or whatever it is. With these like pores and your you know so that's oh, cool. those are the lenses i've i've started using for this and uh been very very happy and the quality is just there's no distortion uh you know or blurriness it's really they're very nice so i keep that camera i'm sorry that phone in this case with me uh most of the time and then that's uh that's really that's, cool I'm, that's what i use you know i know with everyone having their phones uh they they really think they're a photographer and i guess i'm 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 one among the masses but uh, I, I have had the privilege of, you know, um, taking taking photos for a number of special events and premieres and things like that. And um, uh, I worked the Creative Emmys last year and uh, did an AFI project with Mel Brooks, which was also one oh, of the cool. highlights of my life. And I, I wish that I would have had a more, you know, sophisticated piece of equipment to to do it when I was working those events. I recently got a Canon T3i from a photographer friend of mine who's, you know, he's he upgrades about once every other year or so. And um, he's extraordinarily modest about it, which I slap him around a lot. I'm like, you should really commercialize yourself. You have the most avenues of being able to do that in this modern era that you've ever been able to do. And he's like, no, I just do it for fun. So, you know, that's, that's fine. But I'm like, well, if you're not going to use that camera anymore, then I'll take it off your hands because uh, uh, I am, you know, um, getting more besides just the still photography, I am uh, filming various projects, um, you know, for myself and using it for auditions and things of that nature as well. So it's really come in handy. Mm, yeah. um, what was your first band that you played with back then? Well, the fir first band was called uh, R&T Unlimited. And R was uh, uh, Jeff Rona, R for Rona. T was Bill Turner, who played piano. Jeff played flute, flute. So flute, piano, and drums. Very strange. It was a while before we actually got a bass player. What, you know, what guitar, who, who do you know who plays guitar? You know, back in the, you know, in the 1970, 71, you know, we were in school bands, you know, we had horn players, you know, maybe you had a piano player. It was horn players, uh, string players, maybe a piano player and, and percussion. You know, there were no guitars or basses or anything like that. Or if you had basses and they had an actual bass guitar, maybe you could pull that off. But anyway, it was a very strange sort of a deal and we actually we did some gigs you know we did some yeah we were young i mean we were like 15 16 something like that but that was that was my first band that band also went on to uh, do the battle of the bands here in los angeles and i know battle of the bands has become sort of oh yeah the local bar yeah, has a battle of the bands kind of no, this was like the la the la county the la parks and recreation department sponsored this thing it was like a real event 
and they had we made it to the finals at the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. And, uh, and we got there and we tied for first. They had all sorts of different divisions. We tied for first in the uh, combo division. And we tied with a group that was uh, did like kind of country, like, uh, you know, hillbilly country kind of stuff. And they couldn't. And we were sort of, you know, jazzy, uh, you know, I dare say fusiony. We had a bass player at this point as well. And so we did Spain by Chick Corea, and, and we did sort of an interesting version of Fire and Rain with a, a 5 4 solo in the middle of it, you know, just all sort of rocked up, jazzed up, you know, with, with flute solo. And sure, of course. And so we tied for first place. It was very cool. And Jeff won one of, I think, four outstanding instrumentalists of the whole night. Wow. Also, another, uh, the high schools also had their stage bands there, and Alex Acuna was in uh, Alex Acuna? Either Al, uh, oh, I think I think I got I got the wrong guy. Uh, who was the guy who played drums for James Taylor, who who passed away? Um, I oh man, I anyway he was in one of the stage bands. He was from Eagle Rock High School, and he was wow. in that that uh, uh, the finals in this was 1974. Anyway, one other aside about that band, Jeff Rona went on to learn to play keyboards, do some other stuff. He sort of worked for Roland, the keyboard company, electronics company. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the people on the committee that invented MIDI back in 1983. No kidding. So he's he's a, a smart guy. Yeah. Smart to put the flute Obviously. aside and get out the keyboards and, and all of that stuff. Uh, he's done, he's pretty, he's very well regarded. He went on to score a bunch of TV stuff. Uh, he, he was one of the Hans Zimmer sort of uh, associates. Uh, He's done very, very well. And he still, he gives lectures and stuff like that. And, and he's kind of on the board at Roland. And, and there's a MIDI 2.0 that they're working on right now. And I asked him, I said, are you going to be involved in that? He says, ah, they, you know, they know where to find me, you know, it's, <laughs> but he I got my number. Yeah. But he, uh, th that was a very cool thing. And I didn't learn that until kind of recently. Uh, the other guy, uh, actually the other two guys in the band uh, was uh, Jimmy Walker, Jim, not not that Jimmy Walker, but Jim right. Walker was on bass. He passed away at a young age, and I, I can't remember how. And Bill Turner on piano passed away just a couple of years ago, and I'd been in and out of touch with him over the years. And when he passed away, I got together with Jeff, and I hadn't seen him in 35 or 40 years. And uh, we sat down and, and had, uh, had a, a dinner and some drinks and just went over old times. And I think that's when I learned what he had been doing with his life all these years. And uh, it's like, wow, you actually did something cool. He says, well, you did pretty, you did okay yourself. I've, you know, I've seen all your gold records and stuff online. So, you know, <laughs> but that's, so that was the first band. That was a pretty good uh, association, even if it was just in the beginning, you know, two of us went on, well, two of us went on to stay alive and actually do some pretty cool things. For sure. That's unbelievable. Um, what a, what an, uh, what an incredible start, you know, before, before your next start and how cool that you got to play at the Hollywood Bowl uh, of all places where you would end up performing with Al many times over the years and I've uh, seen a couple concerts. more times yeah actually that that was in 1974 was not the first time I'd played at the Hollywood Bowl uh, I was there a couple of years before I was in a marching band it was the uh, Los Angeles Police Department uh, like a junior band like they sponsored you know uh, kids to come be in this band and, and they entered parades and they were state champions, California state, you know, junior band champions. They were the national junior band champions. It was quite a, you know, they were almost a borderline core, you know, they weren't quite there because we had saxophones and, and other things in the cores don't have, but uh, it was, it was at that level. They, they were kind of a wannabe core. So it was a very prestigious organization. And we played at the Hollywood bowl a couple of times for, some uh, LA police department events where they had some celebrities come and, and do some stuff, but they were, it was sort of a, a picnic-y type thing. And, and uh, you know, they'd have entertainment all day. Roy Clark came down and did one of the shows. Wow. Uh, it, it was, it was a very cool thing. So I actually had played, I did two of those with them there. So I actually played there a couple of times before 74. And then it would be, uh, you know, 34 more years before I'd be there again. But. Oh wow. Well. Absolutely amazing. And you've, uh, throughout the years, you've been able to have some pretty incredible collaborations with, uh, with, a, lot, with a lot of other bands, um, besides, you know, Al and the band, of course, um, which I made a random list, uh, Apologetics, 
Jim Silvers, Idle Hands, Raymond and Scum, um, among others. You, you've you've uh, you played on a, uh, on a bunch of great tracks. Um, what is there any one of those uh, tracks from the bands I mentioned, or some of the others that you've played with that sort of stands out to you? Uh, well, I I uh, you know did a lot of recordings with a lot of people. Didn't necessarily go on to play in bands with them or played later on in bands with them. Uh, right. uh, I did, uh, no, you mentioned Jim Silvers and he had a couple of albums out. I played on one of those and met a bass player named Ray Campy. And Ray is very well known in uh, the, the rockabilly world, uh, toured Europe and, and uh, you know, the States and uh, very well respected. And I ended up actually doing some recordings with him later and, and uh, doing some gigs with him. But at the time, like 1981, somewhere in there, uh, his piano player, Rip Masters, was uh, uh, looking for a drummer. And I guess Ray dropped my name and I hooked up with Rip in early 1981. And I've been working with Rip ever since. So in, in terms of all the bands I've, I've worked with or work with, he's the second longest, second only to Al by several months that, I, that I'm still working with. Uh, you mentioned Idle Hands. I've been working with those guys for about 15 years. Uh, actually, some of them were longer than that. Uh, there's another band I play with called Zero G Band. I've been playing with them 11 years. We just do covers. There's one gig we do, and there's one place we play uh, that we, until the pandemic hit anyway, we had one gig a month. Uh, every January, they would give us our entire year schedule. If I was going on the road that year, I have a sub that knows what dates he would be filling in for me. Uh, great people in the band as well. Great following. Uh, really enjoyed working with that. Really, really looking forward to working with them again, you know, when, whenever that is. Uh, uh, haven't worked with Rip in a while. I, Rip is the last guy I worked with on March 10th. So it's been a while. Uh, so Rip, Idle Hands, and Zero G are my three current bands. Uh, Apologetics, I had been in touch with them and I recorded eight or nine or 10 songs with them. We were in Pittsburgh and had a day off and they're based in Pittsburgh. And they asked if I would, I mean, you know, in advance of us getting there, asked if I would come and, and do some recordings with them. I said, I'm sure, I would love to. And so went in and, and, you know, with the blessings of their drummer, uh, you know, he was there, you know, and, and he thought that was very cool to have me sit in his chair. And uh, that came out on a, an album called, uh, several of the songs they did called Biblical, Biblical Graffiti. And it's the one that looks like the wall. It's got the white bricks and, and uh, it's that album. And a couple of those tracks were pulled and used on uh, some other sort of compilations. So I've got a couple of credits with them. Uh, I stay in touch with them, a bunch of good guys. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, Raymond and Scum. You know, I think I did one or two songs with them, and and you know, just a sort of you know guest drummer kind of thing. I sure. never did any gigs with them, but there have been several several groups I played with over the years. Um, the Aaliyah Band, a, a gal named Aaliyah Khan, did some interesting things. I met. She had a cello player in the band. I have some weird band things. I have flute, piano, uh -huh. drums. There's another band with a cello player in it. You know, in, in and like an alternative band you know, doing yeah. all the, the rock clubs and stuff. But I ended up doing a bunch of other recordings with him. Uh, you know, it's just, it's it, there's a certain amount of networking. There's a certain music community. And if people like the way you play, or if you are if you play well, but you're a good guy and easy to get along with and easy to direct, you know, you, you get work. And uh, so there's, you know, a lot of my bands have come out of knowing someone else in another band, you know, and, and then I get brought into another project or maybe brought in to do some demos or some other kind of recordings or something like that. So, and I still, you know, even though Al is my full-time gig, uh, you know, I, I have a year off now and then, like this year happened to be an actual year off for us anyway. Uh, but in between tours, uh, I play with all these other bands and they're very nice to let me go on the road and disappear for three, four, five months and then come back into the band. I mean, they don't have to do that. And that's kind of unusual, uh, you know, because once, you know, if, you, if you're not steady with a band and they find another drummer they like who's in town and not, no chance of them going on the road, Usually they'll go with them. Usually it's like, you know what, we need someone that we can count on every time. And, you know, we don't have to retrain them when they show up every summer while you're gone and et cetera, et cetera. And all of the and rip and zero G and idle hands have all been great. Uh, let me come back, come right back in. And uh, with rip and it's all, again, it's all part of the sort of rockabilly alternative community. Uh, Rips, one of his subs for me while I'm gone is DJ bone break from X which is a pretty cool deal. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's nice to be replaced by him, you know, that it, that it takes DJ to replace me. <laughs> so. 
Well, um, you're absolutely one of the best. And that's so incredible that you are able to collaborate with so many, you know, amazing artists and, and other bands and they keep asking you back. Referrals are the best, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's rare when you get them and it's so much appreciated when you do. Um, I love getting those surprise emails. Hey, would you like to come out to this set? Yes, I would. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get some of those emails right now, but, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's tough right now. It's <laughs> tough. And California is, uh, is, is fairly locked down. They're really, it hasn't sort of come back. And then, you know, uh, like some states, some cities yeah. have opened up and I, I know people that are out doing some gigs. Well, we and, can't uh, figure it out. We can't seem to figure it out. You know, we're locked down and then we're not, and people can't figure out what they're doing with the masks and then when to wear them and when not to wear them. And there's, you know, um, I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't pummel the uh, the general um, swath of intelligence, um, <laughs> but you know, um, I, I have my mask in my pocket just just yeah. in case, you know. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing all of that with me. That's, oh, that's sure. unbelievably uh, interesting and something that I would otherwise be able to you know un unless I having you here in person is the only way that I would be able to, uh, to hear those stories. So I really appreciate it. Um, again, reading through the various stories in the book, I love the mention of the, uh, the kids with the accordions on the I Love Rocky Road shoot. And uh, <laughs> you, you said that you, nobody really knows like uh, what, what happened with that or, or where the footage went. That's here's, here's something. Uh sort of cool, sort of unfortunate, but sort of cool is, you know, when I wrote all the intros to the chapters, I really tried, I was, I was as diligent as I thought I could be to get certain information. I, I couldn't reach some people. Uh, the people that I could reach didn't have the information I needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was just tough. And, and I, I, I didn't lie about anything, but I didn't put as much complete information as I would have liked to. So, and, and that, and talking about all the kids on the I Love Rocky Road video, that was one of the things that I wasn't able to get the information at the time. Now, after I submitted my thing and, you know, okay, this is my final thing, go ahead, let's print the book. Then all of a sudden, all this other information started coming in. You know, the little kid, the little Ricky in the Ricky video, you know, I knew his name was Sasha, didn't know his last name. I know it now. <laughs> Right. You know, I wish I could go back five months when we He's submitted like, this. You better get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And now I and I got a little bit more direction on all the kids with accordions. There was 15 kids with accordions, plus their teacher, uh, a, a lady named Ruth. She was in a band called Hot Food to Go, who had a sort of a hit on, on Dr. Demento's show called I Get Weird. Awesome. So so she was invited out, and those were her students at the time. She brought out all the students, they all brought their accordion. Uh and they had some sort of a bit they were going to do, and and it turns out that that whatever it was wasn't as exciting as they thought it was going to be, <laughs> you know, as the director thought it was supposed to be, and it didn't yeah. get used. But they did actually tape their thing, whatever that was. And I'm in a picture with them in there, and there's another picture that doesn't appear in the book, but the guys there with the camera, so I know they were shooting it. Uh -huh. And I don't, I was there and I don't remember it. So it was, you know, this was tough, but I didn't hook up with her. I didn't get a little more direction on it until after I had written the chapter. So I can, I can say a little bit more. I don't know if I'll say on, on this interview, I don't know if I'll say in, in print that, okay. you know, you whatever did they did wasn't acceptable, <laughs> but, but that's basically it is they did something and it's like, yeah, that's, that's not working. You know, thanks for coming down anyway. So, okay. but I didn't even know that much when I wrote all of this. Wow. And, and there's just, there's a few other things that I learned later. Now, if the book goes into a second printing and uh, if I'm allowed to, if we're going to make edits or if we do an expanded edition and we have mm -hmm. a chance to actually alter it, I will add the little kid's name, Sasha, Sasha Guzzi is his name. Uh, I will add some other names. I will, you know, explain a little bit more about the uh, accordion kids, you know, and I'll flesh it out a little bit. But when I wrote this, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, once I'm done, it's like, I couldn't figure it out all of a sudden. Oh yeah, I was there. Or, you know, I was, yeah, I, I brought the kids down and, you know, it, well, you know, why didn't you ask this person to get me? And so that was, you know, if I could go back, you know, some of the text would look a little bit different now, but in future, or they, they can watch uh, this podcast and then uh, they'll know. Exactly. There will be, uh, yeah, this will be up on YouTube, this video footage. So yeah, they'll, they'll be able to check it out. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
This year has been exceptionally difficult for most of us. I admit I've been going through some things that have pulled my psyche into what seems to be a bottomless well a number of times over these months, especially at this very moment, as building maintenance is renovating the apartment next door, interrupting me every second I attempt to record this spot. If you are feeling depressed, overwhelmed, or anxious like I am, BetterHelp has licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help. BetterHelp is not a crisis line or self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online with a global network of counselors who are always ready to listen. Connect privately with your counselor by text, phone, or video calls so you never have to worry about leaving the comfort of your pajamas with the Garfield footies. BetterHelp is committed to therapeutic matches for all clients, so they make it easy to change counselors at any time. Everything you share is confidential. Just fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs and you will be matched with the counselor in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is an affordable option and Faux Real listeners get 10% off their first month by using the discount code Faux Real. Just go to betterhelp.com forward slash Faux Real. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com forward slash F-A-U-X-R-E-A-L to speak with a therapist today and get the help you need from better help. I've seen you and Al in concert, I think at this point, 18 or 20 times. Um, oh. Going all the way back to the Bad Hair Day tour in 96, which was actually in St. Louis at the Westport Playhouse. Interesting little venue. Um, and uh, one of those many performances that I've, I've uh, seen you at was the infamous DeCoin State Fair performance during the second leg of the Poodle Hat Tour. Oh. And I'm not sure if you remember it, but you probably do, because um, there was a swarm of, of mayflies everywhere. Yeah. Yep. Are, you, are you still picking the mayflies out of various <laughs> pieces of clothing? F finally, finally got them out a couple of years ago. Okay, okay, Fine. good. Finally got them off all the cymbals and out of all, you know, outside, you know, pulled them out of the drums and stuff like that. I'm sure it took a while. That was a, that was a wild concert. It really was. Yeah. Um, actually... <laughs> I, I remember, I remember that one well. I remember, I think, and Al is, is vegan, you know, he's vegetarian again now, but I think a couple of them flew in his vegan. mouth. So he was, whereas if he was still eating meat, he would have just eaten them and it wouldn't have been any big deal. <laughs> the fact that they were you know, animals, it was like really, that really uh, bugged him as it were. So. <laughs> but no, shh, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually took a date to that concert, which, um, you know, I found out about halfway through was a pretty bad idea. She, she didn't uh, enjoy it nearly as much oh. as I did. You're not still seeing her, are you? I am not. No. Good. Well, okay. Good choice. That's, that's number one deal breaker, you know, <laughs> um, Toe fungus and not enjoying owl music. That's right. right well, you can you can fix toe fungus. That's right. You exactly. know, but you can't. If someone doesn't get owl, you can't make them. It's like they either get it or they don't. That's right. Exactly. Um, speaking of of that that venue and that <laughs> performance, you know, you uh, you've played at so many exotic and strange locales over the years, including you know. Um, going overseas a number of times. Uh, was there any like performance or venue or um, like city that you were in that was that was sort of unnerving or, or weird that you experienced? Not, uh, no, you know what? Everything, everything goes very smoothly uh, with us. It's really, it's extremely rare that something isn't quite right. And, and I don't remember anything overseas or even in Canada, you know, in terms of outside the US. Well, no, I mean, you know, other than US dates, I don't remember anything ever being unworkable or, or something where, uh, you know, other than the last time we were in Australia, there were fires in Australia. We were there over New Year's, which is, they're six months off from our season. So they were like at, at, in summer, they were just entering summer. That was like June for them. And there were several fires across Australia that affected, we were doing some festivals for some reason, which we'd never done there before. But again, this was summer, so they would they would be having festivals, outdoor festivals. And uh, one of them got moved because of some fires. Uh, another one, another one completely uh, was, was canceled 
because it was it was on the west coast and it was a little north of Perth. Perth is, is the main city on the west coast. Mm -hmm. And it was so far away from anything that because the fires were happening, nobody could get to where the festival was supposed to be and it was just canceled. And that was going to be the last date of that particular tour. And we ended up going home a few days early. And uh, which was kind of a drag because, uh, you know, I, I like the I like Perth, you know, I like being in Australia, uh, I like being on the road. And, uh, you know, we lost about three days on that thing because of those fires. But other than that, you know, we, we never got somewhere and it, it was unworkable or anything like that. It was just, uh, you know, we had one gig in 1992, I remember in Ames, Iowa, or we were supposed to have a gig. And we were booked into now we're, you know, we have a pretty good stage show at that point, you know, the, we, the, we should have been playing bars. And we got booked into a bar, which actually they might have been able to make it work, except we we walked, we got there at 10 in the morning and I I was I was up and the crew was on. We had one bus. So the crew was on the bus. I walked off with the crew when they go in to inspect the venue and see where we're getting into. And there was it was literally a bar with pool tables and a small like a one foot high bandstand and some track lights on the ceiling. And. And it wasn't like the stage is too small, although it was, or this place isn't going to hold more than 200 people. It wasn't even that. It was like, there's no place to hang lights. There's no place to, to go off and do costume changes. I mean, there were certain requirements that, that are put forth before a gig is approved. And we got there and apparently none of those have been done for that venue. And we literally walked in at 10 and walked out at 10.05 and went on to wherever the next, you know, and had a night off. Wow. So I don't remember the name of the place I have it written down somewhere. That was, that was the only time I think we got some, and there, you know what, there was one other, there was one other in Columbus, Ohio, and we had gotten booked into an alley and it was some sort of a, uh, you know, I don't think they called it raves yet, but it was probably a rave. It wasn't an outdoor... the Four Seasons. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, that would, that would have worked. Oh, okay. would, we could have made that work. No, and, and we got, and, and again, they looked around and it's like, there's just, there's no place to do costume changes. There's no place to, to put up lights. I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, we could set up the guys, you know, with their instruments, but it's just, we can't do a show. Right. And we, we bailed on it, you know, that day. And, and I think distributed flyers to the people that were showing up that didn't know yet, you know, we're sorry. <laughs> Here, uh, let me sign this for you. <laughs> yeah. For, for logistical <laughs> reasons, we were unable to do the show yeah. and we'll, and, and, and we came back and we booked a date later uh in columbus to uh, come back and make it up that's good for that but that's those are the only times i think that we ever had to cancel a date because it was just you know the, the crew whether it's the old crew or the new guys whatever it is they always can make it work whatever they have to do to put the show on uh they will do but you know also in the last several years last 20 years really you know we're getting into places where they're proper venues and and you know we're not playing sort of iffy kind of deals you know we did place we did do a thing and it was, I think it was supposed to be, it was going to be the parking lot in between the Coliseum and the, some other place. And it turned out to be the back parking lot between two bars and a strip mall. And one of them was called the Coliseum and one of them, <laughs> but we did the gig. We did the gig. That's amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure we got paid, but. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. I got to get those checks. But, but it's, re, it's really rare that we get somewhere and it's, I mean, in the last 20, 25 years, you know, or so, I don't think we've had any issues. That's, that's amazing. You also mentioned in the book um, <laughs> about, you mentioned in the book about Vincent Patterson, who played the original gang leader in, um, uh, in the Beat It video and then repri reprised his role in the Eat It video. Uh, that he kept the rub rubber chicken from the shoot. Yeah. <laughs> have you uh, have you ever held on to? I know, uh, obviously, you're the the archivist for the band, and you keep track of, you know, um, all of the the performances over the years. Do you have any like keepsake or piece of memorabilia that you've uh, snuck off of a set or like a, a costume or anything? A, a couple of things. I mean, I have I have uh, my bow tie and the soda jerk cap and my my uh, 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 frock or whatever it is from the uh, I Love Rocky Road video, for example. Uh, I didn't get anything from Eat It, and I was the guy, not not widely known, but there's a, a thing. It's both in Beat It 
and in the eat it video and in the beat it video, you know, there's somebody who comes in, you know, there's a picture of a window, you know, there's somebody comes in and they, they look through the blinds or something and they're looking out at what's going on on the street, you know, Michael and all the guys, you know, there's an obvious face. Well, the one in the eat it video is the blinds open up and it's this alien head. Right. Well, that was me. <laughs> and it was this like alien rubber mask thing. And uh, I probably could have taken it. I didn't. I Aww. didn't think to. I didn't think to grab the chicken. I probably could have. <laughs> you know, uh, it was funny when I was talking to Vincent. He uh, uh, he said, you know, I've got I've got that rubber chicken. I said, oh, cool. I'm gonna put that in the book. <laughs> and there've been there've been a few other uh, videos where I grabbed something. The the uh, I think the, the smells like Nirvana video. I've got that thing that they put on my drums that on the front bass drum. This is drum. Uh -huh. uh, I've I've got that. Uh, you know, a couple other bits and pieces. I've got a couple of little things from the Weird Al show, the TV show uh, that was on. Just some little odd odds and ends, silly things. Uh, you know, there's only so much. I only have so much room. You know, for that kind of stuff. There was a thing we did for the Disney Channel called "There's No Going Home." I think in 1996, maybe we did that or, or some words abouts in there. And there was a thing of us on the bus and I come out and there's little, there's little red scorpions all over me. I've got all the scorpions. I've got all of those. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah, those, those were easy. Cause I wasn't wearing a shirt and they were all taped all. So nobody wanted to touch them after they came off. So I just took them home. I will tell you that uh, when that came out, I got a subscription to the Disney channel, especially to watch that. And for whatever reason, uh, and I never really got a straight answer about it, the, the cable company that was, that was playing it uh, didn't play it. They, it, did, it, it wouldn't air, and it was something to do with the cable company. And you better believe that I was on the phone with them and I was like cussing them out because I was like, hey, I just got a subscription. Like, I want to watch this. And, uh, and it wasn't... I don't know. It was a whole thing. Wow, <laughs> I got that, to see it later, though. I tell you, <laughs> that's that's odd. Well, Disney got back at all of them because now they've got their own their own uh, cable feed, right? And and I don't I don't have it, but I wonder. Well, I'll bet. I bet it's on there. I bet it's on Disney Plus. In their I'll archive. have to look. I I never even thought about that, but yeah, that's I, I hadn't thought I hadn't thought about it till just now. But I'll bet. <laughs> Because Disney wouldn't have said don't show it. They wouldn't have told the cable carrier not it to use really it. It was really weird. It was That's, whatever cable yeah. company was was carrying it, and they wouldn't, uh, it didn't, it was weird. It was strange. I, I hope they went out of business. It was probably Dish Network. <laughs> 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 yep, uh, absolutely. Um, is there uh, anyone that you would uh, you would like to collaborate with that you haven't yet? No, you know, I haven't really thought about that. You know, I'm not, I just like playing drums. I mean, I'm very happy working with Al. I'm very happy working with my local bands mm -hmm. and it just gives me a chance to play. I mean, I haven't really, I haven't really thought about, you know, be cool to play with, you know, this band, for example. I mean, it probably would be, it'd probably be cool to play with some of the bands who we've emulated, you know, Huey Lewis, uh, oh, yeah. Nirvana or whatever's left oh, of, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. Nirvana actually with, with uh, Dave Grohl switching to guitar many years ago for uh, Foo Fighters, you know, he would have a drummer, um, mm -hmm. you know, of course he's got Taylor Hawkins, but you know, that would be sort of cool uh, doing that kind of stuff. I mean, I know Dave knows who I am. Oh yes. I have no <laughs> doubt that he does. Absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, I actually uh, have a few questions that, uh, that came in from the, um, from the collectors, from the uh, Weird Al Ultimate Collecting Extravaganza Facebook page. Whoa. Well, the, well uh, in that case, in that case, let me uh, change background so I can, uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, now, now I'm in Weird Al mode. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, the first question comes from Alan P. Williams, who asks, uh, oh, well, oh, okay, that's, that's a different question. Uh, Alan P. Williams <laughs> asks, uh, are there any artists or bands you would personally like to do a style or direct parody of? I, I suppose, I mean, you know, growing up in the sixties, you know, my, my musical uh, tastes are, 
are sort of rooted in that. I mean, I'd love to do some Beatles and, and you know, a, an actual Beatles style thing from any era, I suppose, you know, Stones, uh, Cream, sure. you know, maybe cool. some of the things. And these are some of Al's favorite groups as well, you know, Kinks. Uh, you know, uh, uh, he and I grew up listening to the same music uh, for the most part. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm very satisfied that I've been able to do all the different things I've been able to do with Al. I mean, I, I've done a lot more styles and gotten into a lot more things, you know, programming wise and, and having to dig in as far as learning how to play a certain drummer's parts or pretend I'm a certain drummer in one of Al's originals. I mean, I've, I've gone into that a lot more than most drummers get to do. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy, uh, you know, he spreads me sufficiently thin. I mean, I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't wish for, for anything more. Awesome. Uh, Peter Grella asks, uh, well, is there any possibility of there being another vanity tour? I, I don't know. No, oh, there's a possibility, of, of course, you know. You can always have uh, it. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. At this point, I would just like another tour. Right. And, uh, and we'll see what's happening. It's not a large secret that uh, we were going out in January. And, and uh, they had started, William Morris had begun to book dates. Uh, but last, and I'm talking about the, January 21, right. uh, but last March when, when things started getting pretty grim, uh, they said, you know what, we're, you, you guys aren't going anywhere probably, and let's wait and see. So at this point, we just, we really don't know what's happening. Uh, you know, the plan was to be out next year and, and probably the year after. And uh, at this point, we're going to have to wait and see. Right. Well, we're all keeping our fingers tightly crossed on that, me especially, for sure, because yeah, uh, the like I'm a I'm a movie theater guy too, and you know haven't been able to do that mm -hmm. since March, and uh, no no live concerts or stand up performances or anything like that, and um, it's yeah it's it's been really difficult. Yeah. Well, the good news is when it comes back, everyone's going to have a great time. Everyone's really going to be into it. That it, it'll just you know it's going to be great for the the talent. It's going to be great for the audiences. You know, whether it's in a bar or it's in a, a movie theater or a, a sports stadium or whatever, everyone's really going to love when it happens. And, you know, I hope that's uh, sooner than later. Yeah, we all do, for sure. And uh, lastly, Amanda Deer asks, where's my five bucks? Oh, it's in the mail, Amanda. <laughs> It'll be there soon. No, Amanda, Amanda is an old friend of ours and, uh, oh, she's not old, but she's been a friend of ours for many years. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know what, a, a, a number of, uh, you know, people we've met, uh, you know, uh, while out playing, you know, have, you know, who maybe, you know, they weren't typical fans or, you know, they weren't kids, you know, they were already adults when we met them, you know, have become friends of ours and, you know, and they're, they've transcended any fandom. Uh, and it's, you know, we've met some very, very nice people. Yeah, uh, I know Dave Rossi also has uh, has his own podcast as well, which you which you joined him on. I, I haven't listened to that episode yet, and I and I purposely didn't listen to that episode as much as I want to, only because I I didn't want it to skew any of my own questions for you when we when we did this. But uh, but I'm going to listen to that in the next few days. And I've met Dave a, a couple times over the years, and uh, he's yeah he's a he's a wonder, really nice guy. No, he's he's been great as pod. He, you know what, with with the uh, Dave and Ethan's two thousand inch Weird Al podcast, shoot, that's a one. That's a mouthful. Two, he they they dig really deep, yeah, and just like find these impossible people, these and I don't want to say fringe, but they find people really really deep that like did something that that's significant. I mean, they don't just find you know who who did the makeup on some weird thing. You know, they they like find people that did something that the fans know about. And, and where they dig them up, I don't know. They were able to reach the director for the I Love Rocky Road video. I saw that. Before I did. I tried to get a hold of him back in January, and I wasn't able to do it. Oh, wow. And, and it didn't occur to me to ask Dave and Ethan. You know, I don't know if they had done it yet or how they found him, but I wasn't able to find him. Um, you know, I, there, there were certain things I wasn't able to do, and... You know, I mean, eventually, and then, and then uh, his name is Dror Sorif, and Dror and I got put back in touch thanks to Dave and Ethan. How uh, so, yeah, because there were questions I would have liked to have asked him, like, hey, what was the deal with all of those accordion kids? <laughs> right, know? yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I, Al didn't remember. I was in there. I didn't remember. 
uh, Jim and Steve and the band didn't remember. I asked the guy that that also held my camera while I was working on stuff and he would take a picture of me, Mike Kiefer, Musical Mike. He's the guy that does the hand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I asked him, what was with all the accordion kids? He said, I, I don't know. You know, and he knew uh, the lady who brought them down, Ruth, uh, Ruth, Ruth Nix or Ruth Less as she went by in, uh, in the band. And he knew, and he still, he didn't put it together either until we finally got it from her exactly what it was. And it was like, you know, well, whatever it was, it didn't get used, but yeah, they did their thing and it just, it didn't work out. And that was that. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I'm definitely going to uh, check that out. I, I recently, as I said, I try to follow all the different, the forums, like um, I was very, very active on the Weird Al forum for a long time and I sort of fell off and I try to follow all the various, you know, different pages and things, but there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that the, the pop, the, I think the most popular one is on Facebook and close personal friends of Al of on Facebook. Uh, I just, I just stumbled across, there's like a Weird Al fan uh, Facebook group as well with like 1700 people in it. I'd never, it's probably a lot of the same. I assume it's a lot of the same people. Yeah. I'd never even heard of that one. I, I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, but here's this, this other group with more than just a few hundred people. I mean, it's a significant group, you know, that, and, that I hadn't heard of in all these years on Facebook. Wow. So, you know, I, I'm sure there's a bunch of, yeah, the Weird Al forum or Woe Way as, as we knew it for <laughs> yeah. a long time. That's uh, Bart Van Den Acker's forum. Uh, he's out of uh, Netherlands. And we've, we've met him, uh, well, we've met him both in the States and when we played Amsterdam, he's come to the shows. Wow. And uh, yeah, you know what, the, the Facebook forum uh, has kind of taken over where Woe Way, uh, you know, is is it's pretty desolate there now. I mean, if there's one one or two posts a week, that's a yeah, big it's a little it's a little slow, but, yeah. but you're right. Everything has sort of translated over to Facebook and, uh, you know, yeah. it all it all migrates sort of into the the same well um and it's of course a lot of the same people who are you know presenting the information and sharing it so and that's really awesome that you personally you know drop in there from time to time on the on the facebook that's that's very cool um well i i learn a few things you know some of the fans find things or discover things that i don't know about uh you know that's pretty cool they'll come up with a photo of something that that uh you know, that's maybe one of my photos. So I feel like jumping in and explaining something about it. Uh, you know, like there was uh, someone had posted a picture of Al and the, and the monkeys, Mickey, Davy, and Peter with Al dressed up as Mike Nesmith, you know, with the wool hat and, and uh -huh. a shirt with the big buttons down it and a picture of him with them, uh, obviously off stage. Well, that that's my photo. And I don't think it was a question that it was my photo or not, but one thing it was taken, I'm sure, however many generations it went through from weirdal.com when I posted it probably in the nineties, in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, back yeah. when I invented that site. <laughs> so it was, it was a smaller resolution. It was probably deliberately not very, very uh, big, just be, you know, people were still on dial up then uh, web space was, you know, you didn't get very much space for your website. So I couldn't have, you know, 120, 150, 200 K photos. They had to be like 20, 25 K you know, so you can imagine how, how crunchy, how pixelated that was. So here's this terrible photo. So I went and got an alternate shot and scanned it, and, you know, and, and made a nice big one and put that up. So one, you get to see how clean it should have been and you get to see a different shot, you know, and I explained, you know, a little bit about what, uh, what they did and, you know, had to throw in, yeah, I also have a tape of Al on stage with them, you know, yeah. being introduced as Mike, you know, it's Mike, Mike. No, that's not Mike. It's weird. Al. Wait a minute. What are you doing? <laughs> What are you doing, Weird Al? Oh, wow. Anyway. Uh, how, how, was, how was that experience, like, with the monkeys? And I, I've, I've followed their music, too, you know, um, for a long time. And I was listening to, um, you know, Last Train to Clarksville before I even realized. I just thought it was a fun song, you know, uh, before I even realized they were the monkeys, you know. Um, yeah, it's very cool. It, it was fun. I mean, I you know, I, I'm sure Al and and certainly I was a Monkees fan, and uh, had all the albums and and uh, it was a pretty cool deal. You know, one thing about that tour, now we we opened for them in 1987, and we went out on the road because we didn't really have anything else to do. That was after the Polka Party album, which was not a 
very popular album at the time. Uh, it's still one of only a few albums that has not even gone gold, you know, even 24, 34 years later, still hasn't even gone gold. Uh, so that was after, you know, the first album, second album, third album, fourth album is, uh, you know, kind of stiff. So it's like, oh, so we didn't really have a tour and couldn't really go out, you know, on that. And we were invited out by the Monkees who had done a tour in 86 for their 20th anniversary, big push on MTV. And they went out and booked a big tour, did great. So they thought, oh, great, we're, we're a band. So they book a tour for 1987, bring us out. We didn't have anything better to do. And now it's like everyone had sort of spent their, their uh, enthusiasm in 86 on them. And the attendance wasn't quite, you know, what the Monkees had expected. And uh, now we played some good sized places, but uh, it was it was a little bit of a quiet tour for them. And we played places with them that we came back and played on our own later and sold out that even wow. with monkeys and us didn't sell out back in 87. But uh, a lot of great folks on that tour, a big crew, I'm um, still in touch and still friends with some of the guys on the crew, uh, still in touch with the monkeys drummer. I uh, saw him last time I was in Nashville, uh, uh, Sandy Gennaro. Uh -huh. who had played with uh, Cindy Lauper and Pat Travers and done a bunch of other wow. cool stuff. Very well-respected drummer. Played, but played with the Monkees for years and years and years. Uh, still in fr and, uh, friends with his drum tech, Bob Euler. Now, Bob Euler, Bob O, that's Bob O from the UHF. The clown was named uh -huh. after Bob Euler, Bob O. Anyway, uh, right. not that Bob O's a clown, yeah, but yeah, he's, he's yeah. in Indianapolis. We see him when, when we uh, play there. In fact, we saw him last year when we were there. Uh, the, the guitar tech I'm still in touch with, still in touch with, with their bass player that year, Mark Clark. Uh, John Leslie was a guy who played uh, saxophone, I think, with them. Lives in, I believe, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Larry Fisher was a keyboard player. Larry Fisher? Uh, maybe I don't know him that well. Anyway, he also lives in Richmond. Uh, uh, I see him when I'm there. Anyway, it, was, it was a good time. And the three guys were were pretty nice. They weren't too standoffish. Uh, Peter was probably the friendliest, I think. Um, Davey was a little, a little bit apart. He was a little bit of, you know, not secluded, but he just, he didn't hang out with us that much. Uh, Mickey was sort of in between. He was, you know, nice, but Peter was the easiest. We saw more one-to-one -one with Peter than we did the other guys, I think. And what was cool after that tour, uh, they had a big party at a, at a rented house in LA for everyone on the tour because they wrapped up the tour in LA at the Greek theater. We didn't do those shows with them though, but they wrapped up the tour there. And while everyone was there, had this party at this rented mansion and uh, everyone was there and having a good time. And it was just, it was very cool. I mean, the wives, the, you know, everyone, the crew, the whole thing. And that was a fun time. So that was, I really enjoyed that. And up to that date, those were some of the biggest venues we'd ever played. So that was pretty cool. That was a, a fun tour. And uh, it was just, it was neat. It was neat. I, I'll tell you that, that when we, we, you know, they, they were rehearsing, most of the band was new. This was not the whole band that went out with them in 86. A couple of the guys, yeah. But mostly a new band, like Drummer was new, for example. Uh, they rehearsed, I think they rehearsed in LA. And, uh, but we didn't rehearse with them you know, because we were doing a separate show. They hadn't heard, in other words, they hadn't heard us play until the very first show we did, which was in Tucson, Arizona, I think July 1st or, or something like that of 87. And that was the first time they heard us play. And of course, we've been playing together for a few years. And we must have sounded really good because the very next day they started booking rehearsal, afternoon rehearsals, <laughs> so that we, we didn't show them up. You know, now that, that, which little danger of that, you know, there was no problem with that. This was not our crowd that was coming to see that they, they had their audience and the audience, you know, didn't dislike us, but that, you know, I think they probably put up with us and maybe, maybe they liked us, but they were there to see the monkeys. It really didn't matter, but you know, Mickey and Davey really wanted to be sure that, that they sounded, you know, they didn't want the opening act to sound better, you know, than them. They didn't, you know, especially in reviews, you didn't want no to one ever that does. But no. you know the the monkeys were so um, they they lent themselves to several different genres. You know, I mean they they are mostly you know they they had their particular feel. But with the TV show too, um, they lent themselves a lot to that comedy aspect that I I think you know made a perfect pairing for you guys opening for them. That's that I think that was the thought because the monkeys the set dressing for the monkeys they had these big blow up 
uh, Godzilla and all these like blow up sort of goofy. It was a very sort of a party fun atmosphere thing. And, and that's why, you know, I think they thought we, we would be a good fit. And it was a good fit. I mean, it was a very good fit, but it was just very odd that at the beginning, because I thought they sounded great. I mean, obviously we watched them play, but they heard us like for the first time watching us before the first show. And it's like, we can't, you know, this can't go on. Okay. We need to, we need to tighten up a little bit. Yeah. But they were, they were fine. And the band was a very good band. Sandy's a great drummer. All of those guys, uh, you know, Dusty Hanvey on guitar, all, all great players. Wow. Amazing. And Mickey, Mickey did actually play drums on some of the songs. He would play and sing on some of the songs and he played well enough. I mean, he, he certainly was an okay drummer. Um, you know, uh, uh, Peter could play uh, guitar and he played, I think he probably played guitar because they had a bass player. He, I think he, he played some keyboard as well. It, it seems like Davey had a guitar now and then. I, I wouldn't swear that it was in the mix in the house, you know, but uh, I, it seems like he had a guitar on from time to time. But it was a very good band. It was a four-piece horn section that was with them. And, uh, uh, you know, it was a good time. I, I enjoyed that year very much. Wow. Thank you so much uh, for for sharing all that with me. Um, oh, my pleasure. Uh, well, John, you know, I could, I, I would love to uh, ask you questions until um, the, the next tour, but. Okay. Um, <laughs> it could be a long time, but go ahead. Uh, well, um, but I really, uh, I really do appreciate you talking with me and, uh, and coming on the show. Um, I, I'm, you know, waiting on pins and needles as I'm sure you are and everyone is for the, for the next tour and the next performance and, uh, where, where we're going to see you pop up next. And, uh, I congratulate you again on just an incredible work on the book. Uh, oh, thank you. it's really, I, in, in fact, I'll tell you the level of, of nerdy and OCD that I am. I bought a pair of gloves to leaf through it. <laughs> because I didn't want to get any fingerprints on it. And um, I, I just love that, that delicious crunch that the pages make. And they're, they're oh. such, you know, the, the nice thick uh, photo quality pages. And it's just, it's got that, that crackle, like a, you know, um, dropping marshmallows into a fresh hop, uh, cup of hot <laughs> cocoa. And it's, it's just great. Uh, so congratulations on that and congratulations on your uh, amazing body of work. And um, uh, I think most people who are listening to this particular episode know where to find you, but if they are new uh, to your work or to the show, where, uh, where can people find you across social media and, and the like? Well, uh, uh, everything is usually something about Bermuda Schwartz. So there's bermudaschwartz.com. Actually, I think I have links to, to, to all, you know, Facebook and, and stuff like that on there. I think Facebook is probably facebook.com slash Bermuda Schwartz. Uh, I don't use Twitter much, but I think it's uh, the great Bermuda. And I think Instagram is also the great Bermuda. Uh, you know, keeping up on Al is, is easy. That's weirdal.com. And if you don't know how to spell weird by now, you can think back like you learned in school that that old thing, E w before I, I, that's weird. E, guys. Yeah, e, e before I, that's weird. And for the book, you can go to uh, blackandwhiteandweird.com or blackandwhiteandweirdallover.com. Uh, e either, either name works. Awesome. Definitely go out there and pick up a copy because it's, uh, it's a glorious work. It truly is. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank and, you, you too. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll come out of this, uh, pandemic, you know, sooner, <laughs> as soon as possible and, uh, be, uh, be rocking out there again. I hope so. Thank you so much, John. Oh, you're welcome. Take care. Remember, you can follow me, as always, across all the places at Devlin Wilder. That's D-E-V-L-I-N-W-I-L-D-E-R. And Faux Real at Faux Real Pod. That's F-A-U-X-R-E-A-L-P-O-D. That's it for this one. See you on the next one. Bye.